Um, so yeah, we um, have a big, a big uh, call today, which is very exciting. And um, I would say maybe we can start quickly with introductions. Um, typically, um, folks kind of um, flow in for the first 10 minutes or so. So we might not reach critical mass um, for a few more minutes, but I think we could still just get started on introductions anyway, since we have a lot to cover and there's quite a few people here. Um, so let's share, is that okay with everyone, Kayla and um, Christy and everyone? Is that okay if we start with introductions? Yep, that sounds great, Gina. Okay, um, so let's um, share, if you don't mind, our your name, um, affiliation, and maybe where you're calling in from today. Um, so I am Gina Fiorelli Duranlo. I am the clean program coordinator. So um, I'm on these calls every week and um, I'm calling in from upstate New York today. Um, and Kayla is next to me, so I'm gonna pass it to her. All right, hello, um, I am Kayla Bannister and I am a current but temporary employee with um, IARC and I am working there through a NASA Globe grant, um, which is how I'm doing this presentation today. Um, I am currently calling in from Kentucky. And maybe we can pass it to whoever is just next to us on the screen. So, um, Amy, then. It's up for me. Me? Am I the only Amy? Good morning or afternoon, everybody. I'm Amy Frame um, from Tenstrand, calling in from California. And Carl, you're the next one on my list. Okay, I'm Carl Schmidt. I'm at University of Alaska Fairbanks. I worked with Kayla and helped out Kayla with some of the measurements, and I'm calling in from Alaska. And Christy, you're to my right. Awesome. So I'm Christy Buffington. I am on the lands of the Lower Tanana Dene people here in Fairbanks, Alaska. I work at the Trath Yetta campus of University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I am, my job title is science and education specialist and program manager at International Arctic Research Center. Kayla said IARC, that's what that means. Um, I have, it's been an honor to mentor Kayla for the last um, three years or so, and many other young people through the program and in all ages through the program um, GLOBE, which stands for Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. And those of you who are joining this call for the first time, welcome. Um, this group is CLEAN, another acronym. I'm so sorry about all the acronyms. CLEAN stands for Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network. And we have students from Antioch, Alaska. Welcome, Antioch um, and Queen Anne. Um, I sent you snow samples. So they're gonna be doing what Kayla is presenting today. Thank right. you, Christy. Um, I'm just getting settled right here. Uh, my kids are coming. Some of them is kind of late today, but yeah, we're here. We're excited to know more um, about snow, especially that I am not from Alaska. And by the way, I am Miss Queen. Sorry, I have to turn off my camera for now. And some of the kids are not really into the camera, but yeah, I'm the science teacher for middle school and high school. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, um, Jim Callahan wrote in the chat that he loves it when there are live classes joining, which is awesome. Um, so Uribo, which is um, Sunny, Sunny's mom, right? Yes, my name is Sanae Mazunate, Sunny's mom, invited by Mrs. Christina. I'm completely new for uh, this opportunity. I'm so excited about listening to this uh, lecture today. And I'm in Tennessee. And then two weeks ago, uh, fortunately, I met Mrs. Christina in Japan. So <laughs> I'm so excited about it. Thank you. Thanks for coming, some of you in this you. group learn about um, what we were doing on a separate clean call, hopefully. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, and then Carolyn. 
Hi, um, I'm Carolyn, she, her. I'm calling in from Tallahassee, Florida, part of the Clio Institute. Um, we do climate education um, and advocacy. Um, I will need to leave a bit early due to another meeting, but I'm gonna watch the recording. I, I, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Kayla, I believe you've been referred to, I don't know if you've done your introduction, but you're who's next to me. Um, yeah, I did mine. I can't see who's next to me though. I can share for you, Kayla, since I know you're in hoping to present soon mode. <laughs> um, Patrick. Hey y'all, I'm Patrick Chandler. I'm an education specialist with, uh, with Gina on the clean team. Um, and I thought I'd share briefly that many of you who come to the call regularly are used to seeing Katie and, uh, you might know that she is going to be out for a couple of weeks taking care of her new baby that arrived yesterday and both mom and baby are healthy. So that is pretty awesome. And with that, I'll pass to Tori. Good morning or afternoon. I'm Tori Brannan. I also work at the International Arctic Research Center in education outreach. I get to work with uh, Christy Buffington and Kayla, I am also an education or a science education specialist and a program coordinator, a recently retired teacher and principal, and then went back to work with uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I am uh, watching from the Salchakit uh, Nation lands in Alaska. Nice. And I will pass to uh, James. Great, thank you. Uh, James Callahan, Mobile Climate Science Labs. Um, we are both in schools where the classes are taught like all semester long, or even all year long, all focused on climate change and climate action. Um, that's mostly in Washington, D.C. And in California, where we teach in the schools, but, but like this weekend, we are with thousands of families who are run up to do with us climate action, climate science uh, labs. Um, so that's uh, looking forward to this, this period of time here. Uh, what I will see over mine is Carl Schmidt. And Carl already went. <laughs> um, um, sorry, about, sorry about that, Mike. Mike. Sure. Um, Mike Jabat from the State University of New York at Fernonia and uh, also a U.S. Globe partner and very excited about this topic. Great. Um, who else has not done an introduction who would like to? Oh, Pete? Oh, Pete and Melissa. Let's uh, have Pete go first and then we'll do Melissa. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pete Suchman. I'm a retired uh, science teacher. I taught 40 years, uh, first five years K through eight, 25 years later, uh, middle school, and the last five years uh, have been uh, high school science research and uh, related subjects. Uh, I am now working with ecoactus.org. I'm a climate reality trainer. I was trained in South Africa in 2014, and I'm working on a book, uh, a field guide to environmental activism for high school students. And I am interested in getting as many high school teachers and students to co-author this book with me about what are the best practices going on in high schools now for environmentalism and uh, sustainability. And I'm delighted to be in this group. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Pete. Melissa? Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Rummel, and I work at the UCAR Center for Science Education, which is based out of Boulder, Colorado. But today I'm calling in from Missouri because I was here for the eclipse. Um, Let's see, I do education design and have a long background in science education too, but we mostly provide educational materials, teaching about the earth system sciences and uh, teacher support when we can. So thanks. Next to you, Melissa, is Lisa Dallas from NASA. Hi, uh, yes, I'm Lisa Dallas. I work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and I manage the data and information system for GLOBE and I'm calling from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We also have Melissa from NASA. Yeah, hi everybody, hopefully my camera turns on. Um, my name is Melissa Rejan. I worked with Christy and Kayla during her SnowX internship. Um, I'm at NASA Goddard and I live in North Carolina. 
we have Blenso and um, and Serena. Go ahead, your camera's on, Serena. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, hi, my name is Serena. I am. I work for UAF. I'm with the Geophysical Institute's Snow, Ice, and Permafrost Group. Um, so I know Christy and Kayla and Tori, um, but I'm based down in Anchorage and I um, basically do education and outreach for everything frozen um, at the GI. And Patrick? Oh, oh, Patrick. Okay, Mike, I think you, you introduced yourself. Um, also from uh, NASA. So Blenso is, if you um, want to unmute, um, that'd be great. If not, maybe in the chat. Okay. Hi, I'm Blunt was Dana. I was having trouble with the, the computer, sorry. Um, Blunt was Dana and I am from Maine and I work for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And I'm happy to be here to learn. Super glad that you came. And then also Amy Chen from NASA. We have a lot of NASA folks today. Hi, can you see me? There you are. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Chen, uh, Global Program Manager at NASA Headquarters. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have everybody. This is awesome. Um, Gina, hopefully I'm not taking away too much facilitation. <laughs> um, but if I think, have we int have everybody introduced themselves? Is it time for Kayla to share her presentation? And once again, welcome the students from ANIAC. Um, we're super glad that you're listening. We sent you snow sampling supplies and you'll be doing what um, Kayla Bannister has shared and hopefully you too can be a NASA intern. So Kayla, we're ready for you. All right, I am going to share my screen. <clears throat> Can everybody see that okay? Yes. All right. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for attending my webinar. During this webinar, I will discuss how to collect, melt, and filter dirty snow. I will um, just discuss how I became a NASA Mainzy Snow X intern and try to provide some tips and advice to students um, for becoming an intern with NASA. I will also discuss how I use GLOBE and GLOBE protocols during my internship. All right, um, I already gave a, a slight introduction about me, but to go in a little bit more depth, um, I am an Army veteran of 11 and a half years. I am also a wife and a mother to a nine-year-old son. Um, I recently graduated with my Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resources and the Environment. Uh, through the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I'm a NAS former NASA um, SNOX intern where I did four semesters or sessions um, with them from 2022 to 2023. And um, currently I am working at IARC, the International Arctic Research Center, um, as a temporary employee uh, through the NASA GLOBE grant to wrap up some of my SNOWX work by entering my data into the NASA database, hopefully, um, and to share my experiences with all of you here today. Um, I'm so thankful for all these opportunities that I've been, you know, afforded, and I've learned so much from each of these experiences and from my mentors. It's just been more than I could have ever imagined. All right, I'm hoping to share um, a few snow memories through snow stories. And this idea of snow stories was inspired by Dr. Katie Spellman, who is also a staff member at IARC. Um, so this idea is to just think about your favorite snow memory um, and to just get us into like thinking about snow. Um, so here is a photo on the left. You'll see of me and my son um, preparing to go sledding when we lived in Alaska last year. Um, I grew up in northern Michigan, and I've always loved playing in the snow. It's just one of my favorite pastimes is being in the snow anytime that I can. 
um, except for when it's 50 below. But um, my family likes to go sledding, um, build snowmen, go ice fishing, have fun in the snow. Um, would anybody like to share some of their favorite snow memories? Just a couple, if if you'd like. Maybe the students. I see that Gina wrote in the ch chat sledding and then Queen, uh, Miss Queen, if you are able to unmute and if your students have any favorite snow stories in or memories in Antioch, Alaska, feel free to share. Otherwise, just share in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Many of my students said they like monarching. It's ice fishing. Yes. It's awesome. All right. Well, thanks for sharing your memories, even though I can't really see the chat. I see the numbers going up. Um, so there we go. Um, so snow is a unique part of the environment, Earth, um, because of the temperatures it takes to develop it and its composition. Um, to me, it's fascinating just to think about how snow relates to additional environmental factors and why it's such an important part of earth. So I'm gonna ask for a few, um, if you have any examples of why you think we sample snow. Some of these photos are some hints as to why we might sample snow. Get pH information from the soil, from the snow, from the rainwater. Yep. I mean, there's there's several reasons why why we should sample snow, right? Um, so some of the major ones that stood out to me: um, clean snow, you get clean water. Many communities rely on clean snow in order to have clean drink, drinking water. Um, it helps us understand global water availability. Knowing how much snow, you know, was produced is an indicator of water avail availability in lakes, rivers, streams, and all that due to snow melt. Um, to understand global water management, if we understand how much snow there is, then we know how to manage our water resources. Um, snow affects the energy cycle, such as uh, albedo or reflectance. The snow is you know, very bright when the sun hits it. So it reflects a lot of sunlight back into the atmosphere. Um, it allows us to understand ecosystem diversity. Lots of wildlife and plants rely on snow for insulation and habitat. Um, it helps us to understand snow melt in our glaciers and to understand snow competition or composition, sorry, um, such as snow water equivalent equivalent we know how much water is in the snow um something else is how does fluffy snow differ from crusty snow um it allows us to understand seas seasonality and timing plants might emerge at different times or animals might change colors too soon making them vulnerable to predators all of these are affected by climate change in a particular place in one way or another so what is the NASA Mainzy Snow X internship? Um, the NASA Mainzy Snow X internship, the mission of, of it is a multi-year field experiment, which includes extensive surface-based observations to evaluate how to best combine different remote sensing technologies to accurately observe snow throughout the season in various landscapes. These projects um, were developed based on SNOWX data needs and student interests and in ongoing local activities. It helps scientists to um, see what we're seeing on the ground level, if they, if they can measure snow from you know satellites, for example. Um, I've included a hyperlink to the SnowX page, which contains additional information about the SnowX campaign. Um, for tomorrow's session at the Globe Water Cooler, um, my internship mentor and NASA scientist, Dr. Carrie Voyevich, may be included on that session where she can give an additional insight into the SnowX campaign and um, upcoming missions. 
I'm not sure the hyperlink is working. Uh oh, I can. Um... No worries, it's in the chat. Okay, okay. thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right, and um, here is a video that's going to. I I obviously don't have snow here in Kentucky, so um, this video is going to show like how to collect and melt and filter the um, snow samples. And then I'll go into more depth about it afterwards. This also introduces Carl and how he got into um, inventing his light absorption heating method instrument, better known as LOM. So this is a five minute video. So here it goes. Let me know if you can't hear it. Okay, so I'm Carl Schmidt, Dr. Carl Schmidt. Some people just call me Dr. Carl. And uh, I've been doing this work on glaciers now and snow for about 10 years. And I got interested in it. If you see the look at the photo on the right hand side, you can see me at a camp on a mountain, and that's in Bolivia. And I'm sitting there not feeling too healthy because I'm at really high altitude. And we're gonna, we were planning on trying to climb that mountain the next day. And it's over, over 6,000 meters high. So it's a really, really big mountain. And I started wondering, I was looking at the snow. If you look at the snow right above my head, you'll see, you know, well up there near the top of the mountain, it's really dark colored. Yeah, yeah. So why, what's going on there? And this was late in the dry season, so it had been about a couple, couple months without any precipitation, and the snow had gotten really dirty. And so I was curious about that. And the interesting thing is that it's right near La Paz, the largest city in Bolivia. So I started thinking about pollution from the city coming up and getting onto the snow and stuff like that. And that's... And I had known a lot about studies in other parts of the world where they looked at that. And as far as I had known, as far as I knew at the time, no one had ever done that in South America. So that got me interested in the whole idea. We're doing globe dirty snow outside. I've got the top of my data sheet filled out. And the next thing on there is to write the coordinates in of where I am in the world and the elevation. You can get this from the Globe Observer Cloud app. So I already made my observation using my trusty smartphone. And the last thing that I did is take a picture of these tiles on the snow where the sun is hitting the tiles from the side. I placed the tiles and for my downward facing picture in globe, I take that picture. The other thing I have to do before I collect my snow sample is to get the snowpack depth. So I'm going to get this measurement in three places. 410 millimeters, 381, 372. Okay, so I'm ready to do the snow sampling and Carl has the videos for that. Thank you. First you find your area of snow that's relatively clean and obviously undisturbed by humans since it last snowed. You'll take your ruler, 30 centimeters, and mark off an area to do the sampling. We're going to take a surface sample that's 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters by approximately three centimeters. So it doesn't have to be perfect. So then you'll scrape off your snow to the center. This will be the surface measurement. Scrape it into a pile. The ruler is a fine tool for doing this. Then you'll take your plastic bag and basically just take this whole pile and put it into the bag. One. And set this right there. Center it. And put the lid, put it on there, and I tighten it just by twisting 
to that. And that's tight enough. Just takes the time, it takes about 30 seconds, 45 seconds, first syringe full. And that's all there is to it. You can imagine with two filters here, which one do you think if you turn the light on will get warmer? The well, dark red. Very, very simple, very easy questions. And so I use this technique with my instrument to understand what's going on with filters and how much stuff is on the filter. And from that, we'll go back to how much there is in the snow. That's what I'm really interested in myself. What you're interested in is what's happening in your area. And I think that's a, an, an interesting, fun part about this project is you get to find something that you think is interesting and study it. And you get inf interesting information about your area. And in addition, you're helping me out because this other aspect, looking at the photos and looking at the filters, that's what I'm really interested in. All right. That was a great visual of how um, I conducted my project. Um, so in order to, for my internship project, I did the dirty snow, um, the dirty snow collect data collection as well, just like Carl just showed here. Um, when you guys do it for the students, teachers and students, um, you won't have those tiles to take the photos of the, um, in the very beginning when they had those photo tiles for the globe app, you won't have those. So, um, but you'll do everything else. Um, so for my project, Dirty Snow, I use the question formulation technique to think about what I wanted to do for my internship project. Kind of had a free, um, you know, just anything to do with snow. I use a question formulation technique and just wrote down a bunch of questions and um, tried to figure out what I wanted to do for my internship. Um, so from there, I kind of like weeded out the, you know, questions that maybe didn't make sense or might be a little bit too hard to do with the time that I had for my internship. Um, so I just picked out a couple that were the, I think would have been the most, the best and the most impactful research questions. Um, so during my watershed class with Christy Buffington, um, we had a guest speaker who was Dr. Carl Schmidt who invented the instrument, um, the LAM instrument, to measure light absorption from surface snow samples. And I thought this was such a cool idea, and it made me think of, of well, the snow that we see on the ground, it's it always seems so nice and clean and white. Um, but in reality, you know, the snow is probably much dirtier than what we were actually seeing. Um, so the accumulation of particles or darkness in the snow would speed up how fast the snow melts. Um, so this landed me for this research question. The first one on the left, um, does particle accumulation on the snow surface affect albedo and snow melt? And you can see here that I'm doing, I made the 30 by 30 box and was taking my, um, one of my snowpack measurements. And here is the melted snow, which looked super clean on the surface, but then you get it here and melt it down and it's very cloudy and nasty and dirty. Um, so then I had, um, I was thinking that maybe air quality could also be determined by these surface snow particles. So another research question um, that I had was, can particle accumulation on, the, on surface snow be used as an in indicator of air quality? And because of um, networking with SIACT, which is another partner of, of NASA, maybe? Um, I was given a purple air sensor to install near my sampling site, and I was able to view the real-time air quality while sampling surface snow. 
So this little device here in the white is the purple air sensor. And then you can go online and I, I believe it's every 10 seconds or 10 minutes. Um, it's 10 minutes. It will populate the air quality um, that that sensor is pulling in of PM 2.5. Mm -hmm. Um, so for dirty snow sampling, um, these are the supplies that are needed. And I believe that those of you that requested supplies have that, um, or most of it anyways. Um, the, let's see, this is part of the GLOBE protocol uh, data sheet. It should be all on there um, if you receive the supplies. In the GLOBE and NASA SNOWX Dirty Snow Protocols and Investigation Sheet, um, this is what Christy was working at in the working on in the video, um, where she was writing down, you know, her location and where she's at and everything, and then um, her different snowpack measurements. And then you'll see at the bottom of the page on the left, um, it has those syringe filtered and melted snow. Um, you need to keep track of how many full syringes you have, if they're full 60 mLs, and if there's any partial syringes with the um, milliliters on there as well. And then total it up so that you can see how much water was actually filtered. Um, so if the um, if the filter is too dirty, like if it's totally covered in debris and particles and it's really dark, um, you actually want to take that filter out and you want to still filter through the rest of the water. So, you know, the total amount of water that was in that sample. Um, so here's part of that dirty snow field work, um, like Carl had showed when he was making on the video, when he was making the 30 by 30 centimeter box. Um, this was one of my favorite parts because I love being outside um, and doing field work. I just, I just have always loved being outside and um, this is just my favorite part, I guess. <laughs> um, so this is what all of you will be doing. And um, for the students, it's important to pay attention and to collect the data properly and carefully because they, we want our data to be as accurate as possible. Um, so the first step here was to measure out my 30 by 30 centimeter sampling box. And I used one of those square rulers, like the um, construction rulers. And it was just easiest because then I had a little handle on it as well. Um, so then you pull the snow into the center of the sample box and then you, um, the snow sample is ready to be gathered here in step three. And then before you pick up that snow, you want to go off to the side and contaminate your gloves so that you don't get any of the debris from your gloves into your snow sample. And then you can scoop it up and put it in your bag and make sure that you label your bag with the location and the date. And I mean, time would be good too. But then you want to keep those samples frozen until you're ready to melt and filter. All right. So um, I'm more of a visual learner. So this was incredible to see to me. Um, the melting and filtering part for a dirty snow. Like I said, the snow seemed just pristine white you know, clean snow, but then you melt it down and you filter it and you get all this nasty stuff. Um, lots of particles in these filters. Um, so you can see there's kind of a pattern here. There's, as the snow begins to melt, it gets darker because all those layers of snow are melting down, you know, within the next layer. So, Really during snow melt is, is the best time to sample, but it's kind of neat to see like before um, it starts to melt, like how clean it really is compared to when it starts to melt. 
All right. And um, I also use, like Christy was using in the video, um, the Globe Observer app, which is a great tool that can be used um, for educational projects or if you want to be a citizen scientist. Um, for my internship, I use the clouds protocol, but I also bundled atmosphere protocols, um, which included clouds and precipitation. So here you take six photos of your sampling area you in all four cardinal directions and then up and down. Um, and then you record the total snowpack depths in those three areas. And then um, you take the air temperature and you do this cloud visual thing over here at the right um, where you really describe like cloud coverage, what type of cloud you're seeing, um, you know, the level of clouds that you're seeing. So it's really neat to neat tool to use. Um, with this app, app, you're also helping scientists to see what you're seeing on the ground level so they can match it with what they see from satellites to see how accurate all of their data is as well. And then um, this is the light absorption heating method. Off to the left, um, you'll see the instrument. It's like a little lamp that goes onto this box and the filter is up under um, it's underneath that light that goes on and off. And to analyze my snow samples, I use this instrument. Um, the filters from the melted and filtered snow samples are placed under this instrument, which measures the light absorption and temperature and how much it warms up, heats up, um, based on the quantity of particles accumulated in a specific area. Um, so the light, this little light bulb um, light area here, it switches on and off and runs for about two minutes per filter. So it'll turn on and then turn on. All right, um, so that was part of, that was my project. That's what I did for all my internship um, sessions. And, um, you know, during the winter time when it was, melting, beginning to melt. I sampled probably, in the beginning I sampled once a week and then I went to twice a week as it started to melt so that I had more samples um, in, the, in the more important time of the year um, to analyze those particles and how they were accumulating. So I created this um, page, just some tips and advice to become a NASA intern, what I, how I, I guess, went through the steps that I went through to get my internship. Um, I gained so much from it, and some of this advice might help you or the students um, to become an intern. So this first one to the left, these are things you should do when you're looking into an internship. You, you know, see if there's internships available that are of interest. Um, look, look at different even agencies or, you know, just pick an agency that you might be interested in or find a job that you might be interested in. See if you can shadow. Um, find a mentor. See if somebody can, can help you and guide you to, you know, in the right direction um, and gain, gain additional experience. Um, sometimes it's volunteer, you know, just whatever you can do to get your foot in the door. Um, so these are things that you can prepare for now. Um, you know, think about why do you want to be an intern? Um, things that you're interested in, um, learn about their mission. What are they, what are they studying? What are they doing? And, um, maintain a good GPA. That's something that you need to be thinking about now because if you wait until later, it might be too late. <laughs> um, so these are how you can get the most out of your internship and how to prepare, um, you know, set goals for yourself. Where, where do you want to be a couple years from now? Or where, what kind of job do you want? Um, ask questions. How can you get involved? How can you, you know, what do you need to do? And understand what you need to do, um, the expectations. Um... Expand your contacts through networking with others. 
uh, get your name out there, reach out to someone who's already involved in the agency or the internship and connect with other interns. Um, these are ways to be successful and personal characteristics to hold. Um, make sure you're versatile, you know, be resilient, things change. Um, be willing to learn and be a self-starter and be creative. And as always, apply, even if you get denied, don't be afraid to always just apply, apply, apply. And here are some unique NASA internship opportunities um, that were offered to me when I was going through my internship sessions. Um, you're able to network with others involved in STEM and space missions. Um, you might be awarded a stipend for your internship. Um, you could get invited to lectures with real astronauts and innovative scientists. Um, your internship contributes toward NASA research. Um, it's, you know, all of your research helps contribute towards the mission. Um, you'll be mentored by NASA scientists, researchers, and other engagement teams. That's part of the, the networking of um, your internship. And you'll gain firsthand experience and knowledge supporting your work. I probably would have never had the firsthand experience that I had, you know, conducting my own research and going through the steps and meeting the people that I met if it wasn't for my internship. And Christy, of course. Um, and you can always volunteer. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, an internship. It could be just you want to volunteer and help out. So to implement my research for my internship, um, in my opinion, the hardest part was getting started in designing um, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So just taking that first step to the research design was probably the most challenging part, in my opinion. Um, developing a solid research question is key. Um, to determining the design of your research. So you wanna think about what you're trying to answer, why it's important, what you need, um, and how you're gonna carry out and develop your research. You also need to determine your time frame. Like for, for me, I had a very specific time frame when I could sample snow. So I had to think about, okay, when do I have to start to have enough time to have enough data that, that'll be relevant for research? Um, some good practices, uh, sampling consistency is key and um, for good data. You, when I took my snow depth measurements, I took it in three, di three different times in a in nearby location where my little square box was going to be. Um, so you want to think about, you know, what results you're expecting to see, you know, is the snow going to be the same? all around or is there something that's going to make it to where the snow isn't as deep in this spot this and that um and you want to always take notes because um when I was I think it was in 2022 we had a really bad ice storm in Alaska and when I was trying to take my snow depth measurements the the meter stick wouldn't go down all the way into the ground to touch the ground so you know, that's part of taking notes and just having that, oh yeah, that's why it wasn't as deep as it should have been. So some responsibilities that you have for yourself is to keep mentors updated. Don't be afraid to ask questions and ensure your equipment is working properly. So that's on, that would be on you to make sure all that stuff is in good working condition before you get out into the field. And some challenges that I ran into, like I said, the weather, um, the ice layer in Alaska a few seasons ago made it really challenging to get a good snow depth measurement. Um, and also we can't control mother nature. So if the snow was, if it was snowing too hard, I had to pick different sampling days. Um, than what I had originally planned. So just being prepared for like, everything doesn't work out perfectly. Um, and also equipment, equipment fails. 
Um, I went out into the field to take some samples, and when I tried to take surface snow temp, the batteries had failed because it was too cold. Um, so always, like I said, note it on your data sheet that that's what happened, and bring extra batteries. Um, also technology. Technology doesn't always work when we need it to, and um, I've had some issues in the past with submitting some data, and it just you know, based on updates or just random technology issues that we all love, um, you know, it's it's just good to always have it on a piece of paper. All of your data should be on paper if it's if it's not already. Um, so these are some things that I've gained from my internship, just personal things that I've, you know, feel like that have made an impact um, on my internship. First-hand experience creating research methods and sampling plan. Um, I had hands-on experience with scientific equipment. Um, I built connections and networking. I have a deeper understanding for snow science, and I feel like I'm a lot more aware of, you know, I, I actually, like, take time to think about, I wonder why that's happening or things like that. Um, so I got to use GLOBE for research. Um, I have very various networking groups. Um I gained time management skills, critical thinking skills, presentation skills, and it it definitely helps boost your confidence a little bit, you know, when you accomplish something. So, um, yeah, those, those are some things that I've gained. And these are um, the acknowledgments for people who have been there with me throughout from the very beginning. Um, Christy, the NASA Mainzie mentorship team, uh, Dr. Carl Schmidt definitely wouldn't have had the research that I have without your instrument and you inventing it and Tori for helping me um, get all of this started. And here's a picture of my puppy who also loves playing in the snow um, at this time. If anybody has any questions or comments or feedback or anything, um, I'd be happy to take that at this time and Christy and Carl, if you could help me on some stuff, if some questions come up. Thanks, Kayla. That was great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it takes folks a minute or two to process, but um, I really loved how um, we had some practical tips for um students and early career folks, um, that's not something that we get a lot on these calls. And I think particularly because we're connected to some students right now, that was really, really fantastic. Awesome, well, thank you. I see Pete has his hand up. Is is there any data within the system on how snowfall patterns have been affected by climate change? Um, I'm, I'm not, for sure of that. Um, I think that's a little bit beyond m me at the moment, um, but I'm not sure if Christy or Carl or um, maybe even Melissa might have something on that. I can give a few thoughts. Um, I think in general, that's more of a um, global climate modeling question for, you know, far beyond the reach of what Kayla's been doing. Um, sure. But yeah, I, I'm just thinking back a, a number of things, you know, personal experience. I used to ski race and we used to have ski races in November in the mountains in California. And now they don't even sk schedule ski races until January. Sure. And so I think there's a lot of examples like that. Um, I'm not sure where to get the data, but it does. I'm sure there's obviously large regional patterns of changes in snow. So I don't know if you have any ideas, Christy, or um, that's a, I deal with it mostly when clouds in the air and snow on the ground and don't really deal too much with how much. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that's what, why globe is so awesome. It's one of the, one of um, the tools that we have to measure not only clouds, which are driving this, you know, that are so important in this energy budget, um, 
but also what's happening on the you know ground right in front of us you know measuring snowpack is very very easy with globe um what's harder and what gets back to your question is measuring snow water equivalent and actually how much water is in that snow um, and how that's changing with climate change. Uh, that is a huge question. And that's something that the snow X mission is really trying to look at. Um, and that's why the missions have, there's different campaigns that have been in different places last year, uh, 2023, Snow X was in Alaska. So Kayla's internship timing was perfect to be here studying snow alongside um, Snow X scientists. And they're trying to deal with climate change questions. So thanks for that question, Pete. Thank you. I just want to add maybe Kayla, one thing um, about your internship that I thought was super awesome is that NASA Mainzi um, had other interns from tribal colleges and that you got to meet them um, and work with them and they were all doing their individual projects. So I, I as a mentor, I just really loved that aspect. Yep, that was cool to see, to see what projects they picked for theirs and you know how they all tie in together kind of thing. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> I'll, I'll make a comment. Um, one thing that I learned from this whole process that I thought was pretty cool or didn't necessarily learn, but I saw Kayla just manage time so efficiently. And I thought it was really cool for just an undergrad working on her degree to make the time for everything she needed to do and what the flexibility, I thought that was really cool. And yeah, it, it really is, as Kayla pointed out, you learn a lot of those skills that are really important for your life activities. I thought that was cool to see that when Kayla said, I got be, I can be there at this time to do measurements, we were there and we met and went and did the snow measurements and that was cool. So thanks, thanks Kayla. Carl. Thank Good you. Job. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Your thoughts or questions? Well, thank you all for coming to my webinar. I hope you got something out of it. And um, I hope it was, you learned something and maybe you can use it in the future as well. Thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Great hearing all of your perspectives, Kayla. And um, great to be connected with you all. Um, and I, I appreciate the crowd that came out today. And thanks, Christy. Yeah, and it also relates, you know, a little plug for this clean community. Um, it, what Kayla's doing was relating air quality and what's happening with the water, with snow, and that's an energy link. Um, so the Clean Community Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network, um, if you're just here for the first time, it's a really great place to go to for lesson plans, for ways to educate about climate and also climate change and also energy. Um, and if I see a palm tree there, Pete, in your background. <laughs> and so if, you, if you're in a place without snow, Think about air quality and water quality. Think about um, what Kayla has done, can, how it could be adapted to where you live. Sure. I, I think the whole category of citizen science and training uh, students is so incredible, so badly needed. And there's, there's more on that app than what I just did too. So there's other, there's tons of other tools on there. Um, from mosquitoes to trees to rainfall, you know, there's just a bunch of different things that you can use. It's super easy too. It tells you what to do. All right. Excellent. Yeah. It's very good to know. <laughs> 
Well, um, thanks again, everyone, for being here. And um, again, to Kayla for a fantastic presentation. Um, hopefully, some folks will be able to join us again in the future. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you all for being here and hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for letting me present. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Great job, Kayla. And thanks everybody for coming. Thanks all. Um.